Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Film Snobbery Live. I am your host, Nick Baisley, and uh, we are back actually from a, a little hiatus. We weren't here last week. Uh, we had a screening that I had to attend, so I wasn't able to make it out here uh, to, to do a show with you guys, but we're back again this week. Uh, I'm excited. This is actually a very busy month for Film Snobbery. We actually have the, uh, the website relaunch coming up. Um, there may be some news regarding that, possibly a party. I don't know. We're working that out towards the end of the month. I also want to encourage everyone, it's in LA, uh, if you're flying in anytime in the next week, uh, be sure to check out also, I'll be at the Geeky Awards later on, uh, I think it's next weekend, actually. Uh, I was one of the judges there, so uh, check out that event. Uh, you can check us out there, too. Um, I want to uh, I'm excited about this episode, and the reason why I'm excited is because we're actually going to talk about something very specific. A lot of times, the guests that we have on are talking about uh, a particular brand, or they're talking about uh, their particular movie, or something like that. Today, we're actually going to talk about something that's a little more fundamental to uh, what you guys out there are doing, and that is storytelling. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, transmedia. And if you guys aren't familiar with what that is, our guest is actually going to have a, uh, a fantastic um, uh, discussion with us about what transmedia is, uh, how, to, uh, how it can be integrated into your project, and maybe even should it be integrated into your project. Um, and we're going to you know, talk a little bit about what is going on both here in the States. Uh, we're going to talk about a little bit about our guest is from Canada, so we're going to talk a little bit about Canada. Um, and we're going to probably curse a little bit. Um, it's going to be fun. And uh, it's, it's, it's good. We haven't had a chance to talk about storytelling very much here. And it's funny because I make my living basically as a film critic um, critiquing your stories constantly. And, uh, and, and, and the, one of the reasons why I love working with independent filmmakers and, and a little bit in the web series community as well is because a lot of the, the stories that you guys are out there are telling are more, a little more compelling than what's out there in mainstream cinema. Um, it's what drives a lot of you know, people who would otherwise not go to a film festival. It's what drives them to go to film festivals. It's what makes them you know, go to screening series and, and other curated events. Um, every time I go to an event like that and I ask someone just off the street, hey, what brought you here? And, you know, why independent film? They say it's the stories. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about effective storytelling and, and reaching that audience and expanding your, uh, I guess the word is, uh, the, the throw around is story world, uh, into other places to, to bring in a, a large audience and to tell your story uh, from different perspectives and, and, from, uh, and, and in different ways. So um, I'm, I'm excited. We have a guest tonight. A guest is an authority on uh, transmedia producing. Um, she is uh, uh, fun. We've been actually been chatting off, off camera for a while. She's wearing a tutu. You can't go wrong with that. Um, and we're going to go, I think we're going to do a little drinky thing after, after, after the show. So it's going to be fun stuff. Um, I want to thank, uh, uh, our, 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 a good friend of the show. I guess we'll leave it at that. Uh, Angelique Toski for, for, um, for recommending this guest. Uh, her name is, uh, Carrie Cutforth Young and she's here. She's actually from Toronto. She's here in the States. We we're lucky enough to catch her while she was here. And, uh, so, uh, she's working on something right now. She's the transmedia producer on this uh, Canadian production called Asset. That actually looks fantastic. Um, makes me want to go up to, to Toronto uh, because, uh, oh, Canada. And they got Molson. Um, no, they actually got really, you guys got really good beer up there. I love me some Canadian beer um, and, and French uh, stuff. So um, I'm going to show you guys, uh, we got a clip from Asset that we're going to show you right now. And when we come back, we're going to have ourselves a little shindig here, a little conversation, a little chin wag, uh, a little, a little hoedown. I don't know, whatever. We're going to have a chat with Carrie. So stick around. We'll be right back. Valentin Lazare, high-ranking lieutenant with the Dragomirov cartel, currently in charge of arms traffic throughout Eastern Europe and the Middle East. He's already discovered and eliminated two of our best agents. We need a new way in. Eric Blair. Sir. Eric Blair. A civilian. He has a pre-existing relationship with Lazare's wife. Lazare won't think he's an agent because he isn't one. We're not just manipulating data here. You send this guy in, he's dead. I thought you didn't care. I don't. I thought you might. Here, you'll need this. Great. What's it do? It makes phone calls. You're expecting what? Satellite control? 
Guess not. Here's no shoe knife, no exploding pen, no laser wristwatch, not even a radio to call for help. What will he do now? Improvise. Huh? Hey, welcome back everyone, and we are joined now by our guest, Carrie. Hi, Cut how's forth, it going? Young. Yeah. Good, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. I love LA. LA is so relaxing. How often do you make it out here? This is the third time this year. Um, usually I don't come out there that often. Oh, I gotta put my, ah, it's, sorry. You gotta turn on your mic. I gotta turn on my mic. Here we yes, go. That's okay. <laughs> uh, should I start again? Okay, so yeah, I love LA. It's so relaxing, and it's my third time this year. And usually I don't come out this often, but this year I've been coming out a lot. And um, my own production company, Art Horse Entertainment, we're thinking about having an office here. So you might see more of me in the spring. That's cool. We'll say, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what brought you here this time? Um, a few things. VidCon. We, mm -hmm. sh we were checking out VidCon. Um, I'm, I'm producing a few things this year. Uh, one, I'm the transmedia producer for Asset, and then I'm a producer on another show for my production company called Snoof Riders, which is a Doctor Who meets Galaxy Quest meets Red Dwarf kind of show. Um, so we were looking for channel distribution. So we came from VidCon, and then I stuck around for the Transvergent Summit, because a lot of my favorite people... I almost people, went to that. Yeah, a lot of my favorite people in the world were going to be here for that, for the Transmedia uh, cool. Conference. So I kind of crashed the party and was picking out all my friends for drinks <laughs> and for drinkies. supper and stuff like that. So, yes. so what, um, what were your impressions of VidCon? VidCon was weird. Was it, it was weird? really weird. Well, you know, it's... It was fantastic, but it was this weird, like I'm used to narrative series and there's a different, like with narrative series, it's very different. And with VidCon, it was very much the cult of personality, mm -hmm. which I wasn't expecting, as well as, you know, a lot of kids trying to break into YouTube. So there was moments of, you know, 14 year olds who were like, attention me, look how awesome I am. I should be a star as you're walking along, which was a little so it, unusual. It, it almost, like VidCon to me sounds more like Comic-Con than it does th a film festival. I thought it'd be more like Comic-Con. Con, but it wasn't. It really yeah. was. It was this weird hybrid, like schizophrenic thing. Even on the floor, it was like there's a moment you're walking, and there's a booth for Steve Jobs, the film, and then there was like Disco you know, Shark Week from mm -hmm. Discovery, and then there was games. And I was saying to my partner, Scott Albert, that it's really strange. Like, there wasn't this cohesive kind of, you know, uh, booth programming where I felt like I understood the narrative. And he's like, you know what, though? That's the way 14-year-old thinks. They're like, sharks! And then Steve <laughs> Jobs! And then, like, games! So, I mean, it was a different, a totally different audience than I expected. Yeah. And the kind of content I write is obviously for, you know, Generation Xers. I'm aging myself. And then to come to VidCon and see the sea of 14-year-old to 18-year-old, oh, it, weak, old, it makes me realize. So I've been writing to the wrong demographic all this time. So that was a. And the other thing that was really weird is all these kids walking around with um, cameras and talking. Yes. And cameras on sticks. And it was like, it was so pervasive. It was obnoxious. It was like a very William Gibson esque. You know, future us. And how many of them are actually looking where the hell they're going while they're doing this? Well, I mean, there is some really surreal moments where <laughs> it's just like, I mean, you know, you see these 14 year old boys and they look like a normal 14 year old boy and they have like the little winged hair. And then you see these <laughs> girls like clomping on them. And there's a moment of like, this is, they have a, reached a level of fame, which is cool, but then it's like, there's level of fame of being crushed by these girls, which I thought was terrifying watching. Like, I was like, you know, that was cool for a moment. And then you could see the terror in their eyes. Like, so it was very, very a surreal, I surreal experience. I wish I had those problems at 14, yeah. just so I can yeah. throw that out there, you know? Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting. So let's, how much business got, gets done at VidCon? You know what? At VidCon was one of those ones where I thought there would be a lot more uh, opportunities to network. And one of my problems was I can't, I was in Toronto time and I mm -hmm. was going to bed at 11. So I think I was missing a lot of the networking opportunities. My partner, I think, did a lot better because he's based in L.A. But, I mean, there's moments where we're at the hotel lobby and we're trying to, you know, talk business and we have a pint. And then there's a 14-year-old standing next to us. And it was just it's like, like no pint for you. you know, 
it just it was this weird like how much business can we get done seriously when these kids are screaming in your ears so it didn't and really it's even worse feel... sometimes when they're the decision makers on their channel or their yeah, marketing you know yeah it didn't feel like there's that lubrication of you know the business lubrication right and the strangest conversation I had was these two kids that were 16 years old I started a report with them because I noticed they had something funny on their t-shirts and they're like yeah yeah we have channels I'm the filmmaker he's the musician you know we collab we have our own channel I have my own t-shirt company we advise with the theatrical uh, you know troops in around town and provide them t-shirts and I was like wow that's amazing and they're like oh here's you know one of our branded little wristbands and check us out I'm like wow I grew up in the 90s you know well I was in my 20s in the 90s and we just sat around at 7-eleven talking about how the world sucked (laughs) right like I'm in awe of you guys That, that typically yeah yeah and they're like no no it's totally different now we all like you know it's so life affirming they use the word life affirming coming to vidcon because we feel like we could change the world and we could collab someone had hippie parents yeah and i'm like you guys are awesome i want to bottle cause, you because we got all our angst out in the 90s yeah and then we were like we're cool now we're mellow we got yeah. all the anger out and now you raise the kids to be like dude no just mellow yeah and they're like super it's like they're rebelling against you know the slackers and they're like if we had done been more ambitious then maybe they could like enjoy their lives a little bit better right but they're they they have to have these companies and so then i said you know what the toronto web series community is very much the same we collaborate it's very inspiring it's very incestuous everybody's working on everybody else's production Mm -hmm. and so you know we're doing toronto web fest you guys should check it out and as soon as i pulled out my card and showed it to them they looked at me like oh She's not a talent scout. And they had this look on their face like, fuck you, see you later. And they walked off. And I went from totally inspired to totally jaded and cynical in zero to 60. I'm not going to lie, though. I went to to an event recently, and it was for uh, the AWTV here. IWT? Whatever. That one. Yeah. Uh, IWT. Yeah. 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 That one. Um, and, and I went in going like, all right, these are other creatives. Yeah. I work around other creatives. I do a show. Yeah. We're on it now. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and you know, we, we, it's not like this is our third episode. You're, I think you're episode 111 or something yeah, yeah, of that yeah. nature. I went in there, and the, the biggest question everyone asked in there, and the only question that seemed to matter, yeah. was how many YouTube subscribers do you have? Oh, it's so... And that annoyed me so much. You know, it's so funny because... That I mean, I started at VidCon pickup lines, mm-hmm. and the VidCon pickup lines is like, I have 50,000 subscribers, baby, how about you, right? Like, I mean, that was, you heard that constantly. And it's so weird. And, and you know, um, I'm one of the co-founders of the IWCC, which is the Independent Web Series Creators of Canada, which is the nonprofit association for web series across Canada. And, I mean, numbers can be seductive, mm-hmm. like the big numbers, but if you really look at it, numbers can be bought, right? Absolutely. I'm not going to talk about some of the major big, you know, uh, Hollywood productions on certain channels mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, who bought uh, major views and I mean you know the only view counts that really matter um, are where you have audience engagement if you yeah. have audi- an, a, a passionate audience who uh, likes your content that is the one that really matters and so if they're passionate and you get something out of it um, uh, as a creator, mm-hmm. you set those standards of what that is. And, you know, for in Canada, we have um, Outwood Dad, which is the number one watched uh, web series in Canada. I think uh, Jason Lever was just talking on CBC Canada, which is, um, you know, our national broadcaster. Mm-hmm. And I think, I could be wrong, I could be quoted wrong, but I think he said there, he has 16 million views and like 3.2 million viewers, which is enormous. And that's like fantastic. It's, it's super successful. It, right. I think it's bigger than Lizzie Bennet Diaries. But what really um, is important for him is not the numbers, Mm -hmm. but his story is about a girl who comes out to her her father. And it's uh, the LGBT and and because of his show, so many kids have come out to their parents. It has really changed lives. It's transformed communities. Mm -hmm. And so even if he had a tiny audience, that would still be impactful. So we are very uh, big advocates that, you know, your actual subscriber numbers, that's a mute point. That can be gamified. We know that can be gamified. Do you find value from your audience Mm -hmm. if so yes that's awesome and you know I mean ultimately um, if if the the numbers that you're gonna look at at if it's not about 
the satisfaction you have as a creator and the communication that you have with the audiences. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at real numbers, the only ones that matter is return on investment. Right. So, I mean, you could have, you know, three billion subscribers. What does that mean if you now, can't and, and, monetize them? You know, monetization, return on investment is one is one thing that it, when I deal with a lot of companies in uh, marketing, because yeah. I, I do marketing myself, yeah. when I deal with uh, that, return on investment obviously is the big thing that comes up. But the, the newer piece of lingo that yeah. I've heard around there now is return on engagement. Yeah. And what's the difference? You know, I think return on engagement is a more of a bullshit thing to run the return on investment because it's kind of like, um, I don't know, what's the convergent rate on return on engagement? I really don't know. I think I think it's where, I mean, I could be wrong, but I think it's more of a bullshit thing. Um, uh, I think it's, you know, all the success goes down to did you accomplish what you want to accomplish, yes or no, right? And as a creator, mm -hmm. that's that's the marker we should be setting. And I mean, with Asset, it's one of those ones where I think it's got a very broad audience, so mm -hmm. we're going to try to get those broad numbers. Um, but other projects that I'm working on, um, tiny audiences are okay, and it's about the impassioned response and how it tra transforms lives. So, you know, I think it depends on what you're trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish. As a transmedia producer, you know, one of your goals obviously is to engage an audience. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what you're trying to do, and you're trying to do it whether it's on multiple platforms or in multiple ways of telling a story. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and so. My question is, is that <clears throat> do you look at when you're producing something, do you look at it more as a producer the same way like a film producer would look at it in terms of get, just getting the getting it made? Is it more project oriented you know or is it more is it more uh, marketing oriented where it's more campaign oriented? I think I, I like to think of myself as like the producer's producer, right? So you have this envelope of production in which you, I mean, if I had a paper to graph, it's like, you, you know, you want to produce it and then you want to put it right into market. And my thing is, is like you want to develop audience the moment you have the idea. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because one of the advantages of that is establishing IP. I mean, you know, back in the day, we established IP by putting it in an envelope and sending, it, mailing it to ourselves, or some bullshit like that. The old copyright but, thing. But yeah. if you if you become known through online through an audience as the person who did that, there's no dispute in a court of law. Like people know you are the person who did that, yeah. right? You know, with that with dad, it's like he is the one that did the story of the girl who came out to her father with these characters, right? Yep. And so with the transmedia, we establish IP early, we develop audience early, you create a groundswell prior to even production right. and then when production comes you're already supported for this audience to be looking at you know the behind the scenes content the interview you've created this passionate uh, community mm -hmm. and that sees you through the long tail so I mean the per transmedia producer I think should be the person who's uh, in addition to the creator the person who's either the longest person on the project or the person who's put the strategy for the longest, right? Gotcha. So with Asset, um, my plan with that is I have a really clever intern who I'm trying to incubate in which I'm only going to be up at the front end so I can train her, but I really felt it was really important for her to be there for the life of the project, for the long tail. So far after, you know, the shows have, the series has been produced, long after the episode has been launched, the season has been launched, she's the person that's caretaking the social media and the transmedia strategy for the long tail for the audience. Gotcha. Right. So is is uh, with asset? What is what is kind of the strategy with that? I mean, because I looked at it, and we you got you guys out there. You just all saw it, yeah. And it looks cool, yeah. And and it, I, I saw that you already have kind of like you know towards the end. There's like go here, and there's a code thing, and all that. What what is what the is what is the strategy we have with a, that? We have a few strategies. So um, I should say that Asset is uh, written by Matthew um, Carvery. And My eyes few, are running for some reason. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> and a few other really fantastic people. Um, and a lot of he came from a, a web series called Clutch. And right. Clutch is a very it's kind of a kind of grindhouse. Um, it's very uh, what is it? It's about kind of the S and M world underbelly. I try to tell people yes. that, yeah, I try to tell people, like, I believe I'm of the internet. You know, I know what Blue Waffle is. I know what Tentacle <laughs> Porn is. I know what Goatsy is, but I watched you know Clutch that. for the first time, and I wept for my virginity all over again, right? <laughs> and so Matthew was on that project with Jonathan Robbins, which is the creator, and um, he decided to do Asset and go for funding in Canada for it. And so a lot of the people who are part of that team mm -hmm. are also part of Asset. And Asset is kind of like the, I like to say it's born meets die hard or the spy who bled. 
Um, so what we're doing is... I like all of that. Yeah, we're trying yeah. to do a crossover with... I mean, Clutch has a very dedicated audience, but a very different dedicated audience. So we're trying to bring them over using the transmedia aspects. And then we're, we're really going to uh, use the transmedia to... Um, uh, it seems like, you know... It has a broad appeal and it has a broad international appeal. Mm -hmm. And it's the kind of show on the outset I thought would be just a demographic for, you know, like skewed towards men. But it seems like it's very skewed, like through our analytics, half and half, which was encouraging. So originally we had, um, we were like, I mean, I crib, uh, crib my transmedia strategies for my favorite people. Sure. So Jan Libby did um, a really great uh, transmedia campaign call for the following using Tumblr. And so we're going to do something very similar, similar on Tumblr. Simbler on Tumblr. Simbler on Tumblr. <laughs> yeah, simbler on Tumblr. That's a new platform coming out. Simbler. Simbler, yes. right? Uh, it's and, it's even simpler than Tumblr. Yes, it's exactly. <laughs> it's just you know pre pressing refresh and new things pop up. But uh, one of the things with the show, um, and I'm just going to bring back to uh, Lizzie. We were talking Lizzie about Lizzie, Diaries. Lizzie yeah. Better Diaries. Uh, what was great, fantastic about Lizzie Bennett Diaries is Bernie uh, brought on Jay Early in which, you know, uh, Jay Bushman, the transmedia producer, was part of the writing team. Like, he sat in on the writing and stuff like that. And that's almost unheard of. Like, a lot of um, producers are very resistant to transmedia or it comes on later and it becomes this attached thing that doesn't really make sense. It's kind of like what they do with 3D in, in, in uh, Hollywood. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like, okay, we can either shoot this in 3D or we can do it in 3D in post. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so and either way, no one wants either one. But that's a little different in, in transmedia. Yeah, and Matthew <laughs> has been very clever in which he was like he wanted to bring me on early mm -hmm. at, uh, under Jonathan's advisement, and was uh, just like you know you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I've been in part of the process the whole time. So I will be their part of the production in which we grab assets that right. are you know like um, either their. Uh, you know, pictures of props or characters and creating backstories. And you can see that with the website. He has the dossier that we have as the template. And we're going to really expand that world. So we'll have two websites. One website will be like the behind the scenes content. And another, we the other website is going to be in the in fiction world where we people can die delve deeper into the characters. Mm -hmm. And it'll be a lot of fun. So we're going to be using Tumblr. We're going to try to make, um, you know, partnerships with things like Reddit and stuff like that to kind of bring that crowd. And I think this is a thing, like in my research, there is no web series that I mean there's a few web series that are doing the spy genre but there's not like a spy genre channel right. as opposed to on cable television there's like you know spy genres everywhere so um, you can have a whole channel just Bond movies yeah, yeah yeah but you don't have that with web series you don't have like a spy genre and I think like the spy web series should all get together and make their own channel because it's it's a lot of fun so I mean we're doing a lot of cross promotion and partnerships and stuff like that as well so we, we're talking we're talking a lot about transmedia right now yeah. and we're talking a little bit about storytelling um, want to remind the audience obviously if you guys have any questions about anything we're talking about, throw it up um, either on Twitter, Facebook, or on our ch in our chat room. Hopefully, you're in our chat room. Um, if you're don't you're not signed into it or whatever, though, hit us up on uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter rather, uh, Twitter.com/slash/filmsnobbery. It's probably the easiest way. Um, we talk a lot about transmedia. What I think a lot of people have different definitions yeah. of what transmedia is. Yeah. What is transmedia to you? Okay, so I'm a, I'm a generalist. I'm I'm kind of like on the other hand kind of person. So I'm I'm good with anybody anybody's definition, right? Mm. Um, to me, it falls apart when everything can be transmedia is transmedia. That doesn't work. Right. Um, traditionally, you know, it, it, there's two ways to look at it. I mean, there's the franchise model and there's the storytelling model. So right. the franchise model is, you know, you look at Star Wars, and Star Wars had the books, and it had the novels, and it has the games, and it has so forth and so forth. Um, that's franchising. That's right. not really transmedia. Transmedia, for me, it's when you use the discrete uh, elements of different platforms to create a haptic space in which an entire story is told, right? Okay. And the audience ha doesn't have to um, exactly, you know, enter the whole, all the platforms to get a sense of the larger story. But what trans means, it means across and it uh -huh. means beyond. So that kind of signifies that the audience brings something. Right, it's it's the story is beyond what the creator made. It's it's that the audience brings an element that creates part of the spectacle. Right. So that's where you get a lot of the UGC. That's where you get a lot of the, or I should say, user generated content for those who are not aware. Mm -hmm. Where you know, I mean, memes are a lot of user generated content and stuff yep. like that. Where where people come into your story, 
and they they add to it. And you can see that with web series like uh, Lizzie Bennet Diaries did that, as well as the offshoot well, Welcome to Sanditon, in which the audience really um, brought their own Twitter characters and stuff like that to flesh out the story. Um, that to me is really transmedia storytelling. Do you look at things like, um, let's say, fan fiction yeah. as a way of transmedia storytelling? Oh yeah, oh yeah. And I think it, that's where you know um, shared story worlds mm -hmm. is is really interesting. A very good friend of mine, Scott Walker, who he was one of the co-creators with Jay Bushman of the uh, Transmedia LA. Mm -hmm. Um, he started a website called SharedStoryWorld.com, I believe, and he advised me on a lot of different projects on, you know, where does fan fiction begin, where does it end, what are the IP concerns, and I think fan fiction can be a great way to really envelope the, the you know, the alpha fans, the hardcore, and I'm, I'm, I'm really keen on, you know, with, with transmedia, you have to hit two levels. You need to hit the passive audience and make mm -hmm. the passive audience happy, which is like the groundswell. But then you want your key influencers, your key fans to really feel like they've had a, you know, a, a part. They feel impassioned enough that they're going to want to share. Does a transmedia campaign require audience engagement? Um, I, no, I think, I think you can have, like, well, they need audience engagement in order to watch it. I mean, like, I mean, you know, what is audience engagement? I mean, there's right. different levels, and we, I was just talking to Maureen McHugh, and I mean, somebody I, says, like, I, I even, a click is, a, is audience engagement, and I don't agree, right? I, I don't but, agree. Yeah, yeah. I feel that that's still very passive. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, but to me, like, there has to be at least some kind of sharing for it to be audience engagement, right? Mm. So, um, I, you know, I, I'm going to keep going to Lizzie Bennett because um, I just did a uh, case study on the Kickstarter, which you can check out at storyhorizon.com, which is one of my websites in which I talk about the theory of transmedia as pertains to inter independent practice. Well, and because also, I, I think Lizzie Bennett Diaries is a really good example also because there's, a lot of people have said that that story can't be told in one medium. Yeah. Like, it, that it requires a transmedia experience to really get it. And is that well, I disagree because the story was told in Pride and Prejudice, right? You right. know, like, I mean, that was told in one medium. But I think that media, I mean, if Jane Austen was alive today, she would be, I think, a vlogger, right? Like, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a different time. It's a different era. Right. The kids are, they, they, you know, they're on Twitter. They're on, I mean, you know, uh, Tim Pring, he said, you fish where the fish are. So, I mean, I think the audience, if you want to have audience, you can't just put things on one object. I mean, you can, but it's... Ultimately, you're going to have to have some kind of marketing strategy, some kind of audience engagement strategy, no matter what it is. And so transmedia is a great, it's not the only solution, right. but it's a great solution when it comes to fiction and it's a great solution when it comes to documentary. So a lot of filmmakers, not a lot, okay, there's a, there, are, there are filmmakers, let's yeah. put that, or there are storytellers out yeah. there that I think have a bit of a... Um, um, it's a bit of a misnomer as to what transmedia actually is to yeah. them and what yeah. they feel it is. It's like, well, we have a website and it has bios. Yeah. Has, or yeah. we have that's, a Twitter account that's for media. the... That's media or multimedia, right? Okay. It really has to uh, go over different platforms. I was going to say, what is, what is the difference between transmedia and multimedia in as much as like, because if it's over like a platform, okay, so you, trans platforms. So yeah. now we, we're, we're saying... Well, then you get into really heady stuff like what's a platform? What's a platform, right? Right. And this is where it starts to fall apart. How does it fall apart? And this is this is my tactic of dealing with that argument is to completely blow it up. Um, I come from the the art world. I was originally a curator, and conceptual art solved this problem in the '60s and the '70s when you know people are trying to decide what is art, what is an object, what is mm -hmm. media. And they put all that aside, and they stopped arguing about, you know, what is painting art, is, you know, a thought art. And they decided, instead of concentrating on, you know, nuts and bolts and what's a platform, they started talking about tactics and strategies. So if you get rid of the concept of platforms, if you let go of all of that shit, and you only concentrate on, because the media is always going to change. Right. Right. Our, it's, it's like, I mean, we're going to get into immersive theatrical experiences. ARGs. And, you know, and... Well, I mean, there's ARGs, but they're talking about now theater as you're going to walk in, and it's going to be like, you know, a, like a holodeck kind of experience. I mean, things are going to change so much in our lifetime. So we got to let go of this idea of media. And really, it's the things that are going to stick to us as the tactic and strategies. And the tactics and strategies of Blair Witch, you know, are just as relevant from 20, well, I don't know, was it 20 years ago? It was or, 91, or wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's 99. I don't know. Anyways, you know, those strategies are still relevant today. So those right. are the things that carry over. The strategies are relevant, yeah. but the, a lot of people try to copy. Yeah. And I feel that that's ineffective. Well, I think, you know, I think it depends on project by project. It really depends on project by project. 
Yeah. I, I always felt that more like you could have your Coke versus Pepsi, where you yeah. have like like Transformers, Transmorphers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and then cyborgs—they're the troublemakers. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I don't know. You know, so it's like you know you'll have you'll you can have kind of two competing IPs ostensibly, yeah. and then you know you, maybe you can have a relatively successful. Dr. Pepper. Yeah. Coke, Pepsi, Dr. Pepper, even yeah. though Dr. Pepper's technically a Coke product. Yeah. Um, but it's independently bottled. Yeah. Or whatever. Or no, independent product bottled by Coke. Sorry. My parents yeah. used to work for Coca Cola. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> but you know, it's like, it's like you can have that. Anything else is just, distu- just uh, diluted. Yeah. And I find that when the big craze with not only um, uh, the Blair Witch Project happened, yeah. but also then Bl- Paranormal Activity, yeah. that Everyone tried to copy that afterwards. Yeah. You know, Paranormal Entity was the, 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 the Transmorphers version, I guess, of Paranormal Activity and stuff like that. And, you know, even Paranormal Activity tried to create a multimedia um, uh, experience by not only having the experience of the audience in the theater, but then taking their experiences and bringing it outside of the theater. Yeah. Um, and showing that as part of their marketing strategy. Yeah. Is that transmedia? I think paranormal is con- their campaign is considered transmedia, mm-hmm. and a lot of transmedia is service work. So it's a marketing around a film and stuff like that. Uh, mine is more native transmedia, and there's only a few people that are really doing native transme- uh, transmedia. A lot of people are doing it's service work to an overall pro- project, right? So with Asset, I'm doing service work, right? Like I'm the transmedia producer around this project that's a web series. And I mean, you can argue that web series is transmedia, but I feel like you have to have some kind of transmedia storytelling before right. for it to be tr- Well, I feel that the web series is the medium. Yeah, And yeah. not necessarily, and you have to have a core. And then it's like, yeah. it's like you have a, a, a hub and yeah. then spokes for the wheel. Yeah, and I mean, they, I mean, web series is very good for audience engagement. Um, and they do all the social media, but that doesn't necessarily mean transmedia storytelling because for it to be transmedia storytelling, there's an element of fiction, mm-hmm. right? Whereas there's transmedia um, is used in the doc space very well, right? Um, but that's a completely different different story. Whereas then I've done projects where it's native transmedia where the whole thing is conceived as a transmedia project from get-go. So um, give an example, um, not a project that I'm part of, but ZTO in Toronto, which was really, if you haven't seen ZTO, go to ZED, what do you Say is it Z or Z? We say Z. Z Z E D dot That's okay. I love the the European yeah, yeah. version of that way better anyway. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So yes. Yeah. So Z. Go to Z E D dot T O, and they were like a, a transmedia uh, immersive theatrical experience, which was out of this world because it started off with like a gallery. It's like a, a c- series of the- theatrical experiences. Mm-hmm. So start off as a, in a gallery space in which you get to know the characters, and you're like having this live event where you're talking to people, and then it went into another live theater event. But there was these web website interactions, and it just went to this like blowout live theatrical event at um, a giant space in which, you know, you're fighting off zombies and it's kind of like a game. I mean, it was fucking insane. And that, to me, was native transmedia, so. By the way, in the chat room here, Kitten4819 said, okay. I don't agree that Jane would have been a vlogger. I think she would have been a self-published through Kindle. You know, no, I disagree. I totally disagree. Because, yeah. you know, that's a self-published... I'm talking about if she was a teenager right now. If she was a teenager right now, she'd be on YouTube. If she was 30 or 40, maybe she'd be self-published on Kindle, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? And I think she was very innov- innovative. And there was somebody who talked recently, uh, uh, an expert who said... Uh, not an, I, I hate using the word expert. But, I know, it's, uh, it's and, almost uh, like as much as I cringe at the word guru. I know, but he was an expert in game theory, and he igno- he took down Jane Austen and said she was a master in game theory and how uh, he showed the game mechanics that she did in all these relations. Mm-hmm. And that's very, very much how we are in YouTube and web series. It's you know, it's not about um, like linearity, but it's all about relationships and net, you know, the, the network and connectivity. Mm-hmm. And her novels are very much like that. So I definitely think she would be like a web series producer producer or vlogger. Do you think and that that's why it's so easy to do something like Pride and Prejudice in Zombies? Yeah. Because it lends itself to being not franchise necessarily, but like you said, it, it lends itself to an expansion of that world or a manipulation of that world. Yeah, and she had a very uh, rich, rich world and, you know, it's all, I, I mean, I think, I don't know, I think I'm spiraling. I don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> we're talking about stuff. Pride and Prejudice for z- and Zombies. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, now. yeah. Um, Let's get back to transmedia definitions. Transmedia definitions. Oh, okay. so, uh, yeah, uh, transmedia yeah, yeah. De- I don't know. See, transmedia to me, it's, it's right up there with, like, um, 
producer of marketing and distribution. It's yeah. like, why do we need another title for storytelling? Yeah, I mean, but that's I think that's the thing that it will definitely at one point just become storytelling. I mean, I mean, when we a lot of us were first doing this, it was like that's so weird, and now it's just becoming routine and accepted. And it's like the tactics and strategies. So a few years ago, I was developing a project called The Crado with Tom Lillaholm and Jim Martin. And, you know, originally we made this Bible and, you know, we had the Transmedia Bible and, you know, network producers like, we don't want to see your fucking Transmedia Bible. So then I started disguising it. We had like, you know, audience development strategies and ancillary avenues of monetization. So that's all we need. We don't have to talk about Transmedia. We could talk about how is this a marketing endeavor? How is this audience development? How is this, you know, par and I mean, like we can see that it's cohesive, but the people we talk to don't need to see. see I, I, I find it like absolutely fascinating to find business talk in yeah. what is ostensibly independent film yep. or web series. It's independent yep. creation because I don't. I've worked around independent filmmakers now for seven, the better part of a decade almost yep. at this point. And when you start asking people for things like story bibles yep. or you start asking for business plans yep. or marketing strategies, most of those don't go beyond a website and Twitter or a Tumblr or something like yep. that. And is that, I, I, from what I'm hearing, a lot of the productions you're working on obviously Canadian. Yeah. Is that more because of the rules for getting funding or for what you need to do to get something made in Canada or the collaborative you know, nature? Or because I don't, I don't have that know, here in the States as much unless you're, you're going for a budget that's like million plus. You know, it's funny because in Canada um, in, or in Toronto, I should speak specifically to Toronto because that's where I'm part of the Toronto Web Series community, even though we have the international um, or the independent creative web series of Canada. Yeah, you go ahead, you speak for the rest of Canada. Yeah, 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 no, you know it's people, it's, it's one of those things, if LA spoke for the rest of the states, there would be like hell you, in the You could go speak for the king of Kensington, <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, um. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the thing, the th there's two different types of web series happening in Canada. You have those that are have Canadian funding, right? right? And usually they can get like, they'll get like 120000 to 150000 from the IPF, which is the only fund in the world that is dedicated for web series as an equity investment. And then, you know, you could, uh, that's 50% of the, the funding, right? So then you have to get the other 150000 So the, typically those, those web series that have been IPF funded are, have a budget between three hundred and four hundred thousand, and 400000 uh, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. And what they do is... Still uh, a nice chunk of cash. Yeah, the, the application process, I mean, for Asset, it was like over 100 pages, but that's including, you know, the, the story Bible and some scripts and stuff like that. Right. But it also included a very... Um, exhaustive kind of like overview of who we are, why she should care, what our strategies were. Budget breakdowns too? Budget break, oh lens. yeah, we, pff, a, time. a budget that made me cry because it's like, you know, I have all these little like, you know, columns where this has to, you know, equal this by 10% and that kind of thing. But one of, one of the smartest things I did, and I think which really helped um, the application process, is, you know, we have six producers on asset above the line, which is, I mean, it's, it's a little ridiculous, but the reason we were able, the, we did this was because we were pooling everybody else's resources. Right. So I locked everybody in a room, and you have Jonathan and Matthew and Charlie and Mike Donis, who directed um, Pete Winning and the creator of Pete Winning, and a fantastic uh, line producer named Vanessa. And I was like, I need to hear everything that you guys know about everything and we start off and we just did post-it notes and by the time we were done there was post-it notes that were filling filled the room of their exhaustive knowledge on web series and then we pulled that into a hundred page application and it's a piece of art right so um, you know there's those people who are making those types mm -hmm. and then there's those who have completely bypassed the Canadian system because a lot of them don't want to write that hundred you know, page application. They just want to fucking do it. And Jason Lever is one of those ones who just, I'm going to do it. This is who I am. I'm going to bootstrap it. And he's got to a point where he just monetizes his audience because he has a very passionate audience that's right. supporting him. And he's got a crowdfunding campaign right now in which they're, they're just coming to the fore to support him. And so in Toronto, we're very entrepreneurial driven. Right. And the reason we are is we have some fantastic mentors in the community. We have Jill Golick, who was a showrunner on TV and has really embraced web series. Uh, she did Ruby Sky PI. We have Robert Mills, who um, he was the guy who did the big comfy couch. And he was kind of like uh, just he's he's one of these fantastic guys who sits you down and says, just fucking give yourself permission. Go fucking do it. Get a camera. Build yourself, you know, your websites. Get to learn the craft. 
And you have all these ones who are like, we've just been incubating each other as a community. And so we're very, uh, for me, web series is the lean startup of media. So you have to understand it as a business. Why are you doing this? Who is your audience? How are you going to get them? Why are you going to get them? What do you want them to do? And that seems to be like a lot of creators can't wrap their mind around it. They just want to tell a story. And they're like, but why are you telling the story? And who you're telling it to? And they'll look at you like, you know, deers. Uh, frozen, yeah. yeah. And so I think that's the thing that we're really advocating for the independent web series creators of Canada is to really like people to understand who is your audience, why are you connecting them, what's the point? God, that's so goddamn Canadian. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you're like, you're like, I want everyone to succeed, and, and everyone yeah. needs to build themselves together and this collaborate. It's totally, very, it's so fucking cutthroat here in LA. Yeah, I know. It's I'm surprised very, you're still alive here. We're very um, collaborative. <laughs> we're very collaborative, and I know people say, you know, LA is very competitive. But you know, they the trans cut a bitch out that's here. not true. The transmedia scene here is very collaborative. There's that's some true. fantastic web series people here who we've, you know, the Canadians are doing, I think, more collaborations with web series in LA than LA people are doing collaborations with It's true. Them. But you know, Canada, we never had private in equity. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons why we have to be nice to each other is we have no choice. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if we do you know not what? help each it's, other it's out, we'll die. Mutually assured destruction. Yeah. It's, it's the bomb yeah got, yeah <laughs> yeah so it's not like we could you know we, there's not somebody we're competing for to get money there that person doesn't exist so we have to like well i got a camera what do you got okay right yeah. it's not like we have somebody we're chasing after right i gotcha so, yeah. yeah it's 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 interesting i mean it's it, like it's 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 interesting because you guys are right there yeah you're too damn quiet um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, not me. I am roommates. not quiet. Everybody no. else is quiet and getting. Hear you guys at night sharpening your skates. <laughs> You're getting ready to come back down. We're going to burn it twice, eh? Yeah, uh, yeah, no, yeah. Um, But no, you guys. You're, it's it's interesting to hear a different perspective of how that stuff gets done and made, though, because there's no here. I've I've almost ostracized just purposely myself from yeah. the web series community because it's frustrating to me yeah. because it's it's very clicky. Yeah. Um, a lot of them are people who have done things in in the the independent film world and then have since said, well, I f either I did not get the res I didn't want to use the word failed, but they did not get the response they wanted yeah. from the independent film world. So now they're going to reinvent themselves over in web series. Yeah, and it's it just seems really frustrating because it's it's a lot of people who are. They're all talking to the same to, to each other, yeah. and they're all passing around a lot of misinformation, you know. And and how do you guys foster the education? I mean, you said you guys have a lot of mentors over there well, too. Well, I think how can we translate? How can we take some of the Canadian and bring it down here? I think one of the things is you got to remember the geography of LA is much different than Toronto, right? Right. So we're very centralized. We have this public system where I mean, there's a running joke that nobody in Toronto and web series has their driver's license, which is ridiculous because <laughs> that creates problems in itself. But we're all very connected, and I think you know sometimes web series in LA gets an unfair. Uh, um, rap because one thing is is LA is crazy. I mean, you got to go an hour that way and an hour that way for people to connect. So I think sometimes you lo lose connectivity just because of distance and geography and. Which and is funny, that person yeah. that took an hour to get to was like a mile down the road. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And so, and I think I think the thing is is that also in even though Toronto is the media center of one of the media centers of Canada, because Vancouver obviously as well, mm -hmm. but n people don't come to. Toronto to break in. There's nothing to break into. I mean, like people will come, hey, I'm coming to, you know, to try to be a filmmaker or stuff like that. But there's not like, you know, when people come to Hollywood, it's that like dream of dreams to break in. And so, you know, I think it's just a matter, I think there are people who are collabor collaborating in LA, but there's always going to be this undercurrent of people who are coming to like, they have the stars in their eyes. Mm -hmm. And it's a matter of just kind of like ignoring those people and just trying to find the ones who want to collaborate and want to, you know, um, connect. And I think it is happening. It's just, you know, sometimes you can't see it because there's so many other people like, I'm here for, you know, I'm going to be a star, right? And so that's where the cutthroat comes in because that's the, those are the small-minded people and you just have to ignore them. And they, they exist in Toronto too. And the thing with us is, though, um, we kind of see it as a responsibility to incubate uh, the future, you know, generations um, of filmmakers. And, and because to us, web series is the independent, new independent film. A lot of our, our web series now is we're using web series as an audience development, but we're doing a hybrid dis distribution model where we'll scaffold the writing to um, recut it as a, or produce it. 
so that you have this extra layer of content for a film mm -hmm. or for a three episode TV series for the European market. Um, so it's kind of like what Sony did with the Bannon Way. Yeah, not, yeah, not yeah. Too long ago. Yeah, so we're really, you know, web series is more as the audience development uh, aspect or the marketing aspect, getting that word of mouth, and then you know the independent or the digital film can be like an avenue of monetization. Mm -hmm. um, where was I going about that? But, you know, when, when we have people come to the Toronto Web Series community, I mean, we have all these kids now, and it's absolutely, like, gobsmacking amazing, because they come up to us with, you know, how do we tell st our stories? And we're like, you and you, get together, here's a cam, you know, you got cameras, you just do it, you just fucking do it. And so that's what we're about. Uh, we got a question from the audience. Okay. So, John Hoff, um, okay. he, uh, the third. Oh, awesome. Uh, he asks, a uh, question for Carrie. Okay. What's the key to community building? You know what? I think it's really understanding what your goal is, right? Okay. And if you have an idea of what your goal is and the strategy of, you know, I mean, sometimes it's monetization, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is, you know, to have kind of some kind of uh, life-changing movement. If you're, I, I, th I think there's a mistake when people think the end goal is to just grow numbers, Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a lot of people tell me, oh, well, we have 30,000 fans. You know, we have 45,000 fans on Facebook. And I'm like, great. What, what do you need me for? And they, they don't know. And then I'm like, what do you want to do with your fans? Right. I don't know. Like, you know, so we can get really, really um, kind of. We want to take all their money. Yeah. Preferably. That would be fantastic. Well, that could be one of the goals. One of the goals could be, you know, uh, I mean, you know, sometimes we can use audience as currency for changes, mm -hmm. right? Um, even, you know, with Jonathan, with with Clutch, uh, I can't remember, Veronica Mars, is she called Kristen Bell or Kristen, Kristen Bell? Kristen Bell. Okay, so he loves her, loves her, and she's doing this um, thing right now with you, uh, I think it's Prezi or something, if you donate to the campaign, you can win a date with her. Oh, yeah, right? yeah, 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 so yeah. and he yeah. really wants to win a date with her, so he's been activating his community to vote and to donate to that campaign to win a d date, right? So this is how we can use audience as a form of currency in some ways. And I've seen that with a lot of people who are like, you know, guys, you're my fans. I love you. I want to accomplish this thing. Can you vote for this? And um, it, it's really a matter of what do you want to do? I think having really clear goals and then figuring out where is your audience, mm -hmm. um, how can you, f where, where can you find them, how can you develop a relationships w with them, and I mean, I think a lot of people got seduced in this idea that everybody should have a Facebook page and everybody should have a Twitter account or a Tumblr account and they get themselves so di diverse. Figure out where they are and figure out who has that audience that you can partner with. Mm -hmm. And I think if you can have strategic partners and you can approach people and say, hey, I'm producing this thing and it has, you know, it's for you, it'd be great for your audience and your audience might like it. That is that is half the work than trying to develop it yourself and do the grinding of adding people. Because someone's people. already done that work for that, you. But it's all about the it's collaboration and strategic partnerships, right? So, but I think the big thing is knowing having the goal and knowing what you want to do with them, and then finding where they are. So let's hit up again all the places where you are, so that the audience can go back and, and definitely find you. Like on Twitter, you're twitter.com. Uh, okay, so slash Twitter, I am cc underscore why. So why is in the question? Cc underscore y. Um, I have my website, Carrie at queenspay.com, has uh, some of my projects on that. I have started a new production company with uh, Scott Albert and Ash Catherwood, who are both web series veterans, called Art Horse. Mm -hmm. So we have arthorseentertainment.com, in which we have um, our web series that we're producing in the fall called Snoof Riders. And then uh, Asset, I think it's called I am the asset.com. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's a few, there's two ways. That, that, that one, we have a lower third Okay, form, okay. So. And then on, <laughs> I, and a good one for people to check out who are really impact, interested in trans media as an independent practice, I would check out, uh, I have a blog called storyhorizon.com talking about different models for um, trans media practice, as well as check out the IWCC. And we have, because in Canada we have to do French, en français. En français. So, uh, IWCC-CIWC.org is our non-professional body. We couldn't leave the French out, right? We have to have them in as embedded as part of our association. Fucking Quebecois has to fuck it all up no, for everyone. No, we, we love them, we love them, we love them. We do. And then Toronto Webfest, TOWebfest.com. If you're a web series producer, please check us out. We're going to be busting out spring 2014 in time of the IWCC annual general meeting.
That's awesome. You, yeah. You're all I'm over the everywhere. Place. I have my Whatever. fingers in every pot. Yeah, and you know what we have to go do now? We gotta what? go drink. Yes. Yeah, we gotta Drinking go get our we gotta get our drink on. Awesome. And this is the thing, Canadians, we're you good drinkers. Can, yeah, yeah, yeah. You throw a few back. Yes. yes. <laughs> That's how we hey, keep. That's how you keep warm in the winter. Can I say thank you to your audience? You can say thank you to my thank audience. Thank you so much. This is, and thank you to you because yeah. you're super awesome for having me. Here. I, I, I'm glad you could take time out. I'm sure that your your schedule was packed. So yeah, I'm really happy and I'm, I fly on a plane to, tomorrow, so I'm really glad I had a chance to get this in. Well, I'm yeah. glad we could relax you tonight. Then yeah. you know, with just ply you with alcohol for when you get on that plane. Super awesome. So um, I, we're going to be right back uh, uh, after these messages. I guess they say. Can I show my tutu? Before you can show we go? your. You can show your tutu. I think. There we go. Here's my tutu. You're good tutu. <laughs> There's your butt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and we'll be right back. And uh, when we come back, we're going to kind of close out the show, do our little sponsor kind of fun things. If you have any more questions, definitely still hit us up on uh, Twitter, um, and we can either get to them later or we'll see. We'll see. We'll make it. We'll make it happen. This is the internet, people. Anything can happen on the internet. So uh, stick around. We'll be right back. <laughs> And we're back, everyone. Uh, yeah, that was a, just a nice little ad from our good folks over here at Hot Pixel Post Production. Um, if you guys have not checked them out yet over at HotPixelPost.com or HotPixelInc.com, uh, you definitely should. Um, you know, whether you're doing a web series, whether you're doing a, an independent film, whatever it is you're doing, they've got uh, some you know, great post-production services, editing, color correction, the whole nine yards. I'm actually doing this in their color correction room. Uh, as you may have heard me say once or twice before. So, uh, yeah, we've got some other great stuff going up this month. Yes, we've already mentioned the Geeky Awards. We've already mentioned, uh, we, we haven't mentioned yet, uh, our good friends at Film Festival Flicks. Uh, we're actually going to be doing another event with them soon. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the movie they're doing uh, this month is, but I'm going to be there on the red carpet doing their uh, some interviews with some filmmakers. So I'm really excited about that next thing. Oh, it's over at the uh, downtown uh, Regal LA Live. Um, it's going to be uh, a really good time there. We did it last Last month, fantastic time. Um, also later this month, we've got at the Hive Gallery, I believe it's Tuesday the 25th, is going to be, uh, uh, a, we're going to be doing our live show on a Tuesday instead of a Thursday. Um, hate to you know, throw the schedule out for you guys, but it's because we're going to be doing it live on location. And we're going to be interviewing some great uh, independent filmmakers there, and it's going to be a party. May also be maybe part of our relaunch party because uh, we actually will be relaunching FilmSnobbery.com uh, this month. Um, I'm actually finishing up the final touches on the new website myself uh, nightly, and it's it's killed me. But I really can't wait to share it with you guys. Uh, you're going to see um, an example of some uh, the the. The way we do our reviews is a little bit more broken out. Um, we've hired a bunch of new writers recently, so you'll be seeing a lot more activity from them and myself. Um, and we've even added, uh, we, we've ad made it easier for you guys to find things, not only great other episodes of FilmSnobbery.com and some of our interviews, but also um, we've also broken out some of the reviews that we've done for film-related books um, and, and web series and also, uh, you know, in addition to our independent films. So um, it's, it's fantastic. We have some new sponsors that are going to be coming on board soon as well that we're going to be uh, kind of rolling out over time and we uh, just everything has been going uh, great 
Um, we can't wait to to share everything with you guys uh, as we start rolling all, out all the new stuff. Plus, we still have some fantastic guests coming up in the very near future as well that we've talked about on previous shows, but uh, I'm really looking forward to having them on. That said, we've had a fantastic show tonight. I'm really, I want to say thank you to the guest. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, I want to say thank you to, yeah, I can say thank you to Bill because he's here. I want to say thank you to everyone who's in the uh, the chat room that was actually asking questions. Uh, Streaming Indie and, and John Hoff, Kitten4819 uh, that was in there. Um, so other people as well from what I hear. Um, and so uh, that's all the time we have for this tonight because I got to go to, I'm going to a, a little little party, have a little drinky drink, a little bit of Grandpa's old cough syrup. And uh, it's going to be a good time. So um, thank you very much. We'll see you guys, guys next week, uh, Thursday, 7 p.m. PST over at filmsnobberylive.com. I forgot where the hell we were. 